In the uh, the writers series that Mr. Gilstrap has tuned us into, we brought on uh, many of the biggest names in uh, uh, authors that there are uh, in the country and around the world too. And Mr. Gilstrap. When we do this segment, I usually defer to you for the introductions because these are among your closest of friends. Well, I wish I could say that because, uh, unfortunately, I have not met our, our uh, first guest. But and you do share the same publicist. We do share the same publicist and same publisher. Um, Mike, i I, I got to ask you, is it Croissant or Croissant? How do you pronounce your last name? Croissant. Croissant. Mike Croissant is the author of a book that doesn't drop till tomorrow, Bombing Hitler's Hometown, The Untold Story of the last mass last mass bomber raid of World War II in Europe, it drops tomorrow from uh, Citadel Books, I believe. And um, yes, so, welcome to the show. Uh, I, I got the book like on Thursday. I haven't had a chance to read it. I've read about it. It sounds fascinating. Um, so, tell us about it. Welcome, first of all. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for having me. Good morning, Mike. Uh, bombing Hitler's Bombing Hitler's hometown is a uh, the story of the last big bomber raid of World War II in Europe. What do I mean by that? Well, in Europe, there were two strategic air forces on the American side, the 8th Air Force, which was in England, and the 15th, which was in Italy. At this point in the war, at the end of April 1945, the, the air, force was, air forces were basically running out of targets. You know, the Soviets were advancing into Nazi Germany from the east, the Americans and its other allies from the west. So, um, by this time, the 15th Air Force in Italy, which my uncle was a part of, was uh, engaged in, you know, hitting lesser targets. But on this day, Linz by now has been, Linz Austria, the target, has been reinforced with anti-aircraft guns withdrawn from Vienna, the capital of Austria. And it's also been reinforced with a lot of supplies, some, some 2,000 rail cars full of supplies are sitting in its rail yards. So with the war winding down, the 15th is dispatched to take out both the supplies and the rail system so that those uh, those supplies could not be used to extend the war. The, the story is about the mission on April 25th, 1945. Uh, unfortunately, the men are shot to pieces above the target, and 15 aircraft go down. We're talking about B-24 and B-17 heavy bombers. 28 Amer Americans would lose their lives, and many of the men who did survive were not the same again. It was just a very devastating affair that they dealt with. Uh, the back half of the book is about the men who were shot down. There were uh, probably about 150 men uh, trying to survive. Many of them landed up in German custody, some in Soviet custody. And it's about how they survived their experiences, and then I deal in detail with the men who dealt with invisible scars after the war and how they, they dealt with it, what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder. So, Mike, this raid was April 25th, 1945, right? Yes. So they couldn't know this at this point, but that was about two weeks, well, a month, call it, before the, the war ended. So at this point, the strategic value of Linz beyond the, the marshalling of, of the equipment that was there, this had a, a particular import to Hitler. Is that right? He was going to build this as a monument to himself. Is that right? That's correct. Hitler would always consider Linz his hometown. He wasn't born there. He is Austrian and was born just inside the border with Germany. But at about age nine, his family moved to a suburb of Linz, and for the next nine or ten years, he would live in or, in or near Linz. He would also be exposed to German nationalism there for the first time in his school. He goes through adolescence in Linz. He spends a lot of time when he should be studying. He spends his time strolling and sketching in his sketchbooks what he would do to the city if he had a chance. He didn't like the way the city was laid out. He would uh, sketch uh, new buildings that he would create if he could. Uh, fast, fast forwarding to March 1938, Hitler is now Chancellor of Nazi Germany. He enters Austria at the head of a conquering army. And after pausing at his parents' grave, graves, he makes a beeline for Linz. 
and addresses a huge crowd from a balcony that's still there today. And the response he receives is so uh, exhilarating and overwhelming that he decides then and there to annex Austria. And we know that that is one of the first steps toward what would later become World War II. Hitler is now in a, in a position to do something about these dreams that he had had of remaking Linz. So first he remakes the city, he industrializes it to raise enough tax revenue to begin his construction projects. His ultimate goal is to make Linz the cultural capital of, of Europe. All of the artwork that his minions are or will soon be stealing from all across Europe is intended to go into a museum properly called the Führer Museum there in Linz, and he would also be buried there along with his parents. Yeah. Uh, Mike, this is Bill Stubblefield. Uh, you, mentioned the muse- uh, you mentioned the museum. Uh, on the 25th of April with the bombing, uh, how much of Linz was destroyed? I'm specifically talking about, uh, thinking about the museum where a lot of the artwork had been stolen throughout Europe, had been moved to this particular museum. Uh, was that was that hit? Was that preserved? How did the artwork uh, survive the bombing raid? The, the artwork in the museum had n- not made it to Linz. Uh, the 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 war had long since taken a turn against the Germans, and uh, the industrialization that Hitler had started specifically the creation of a huge steel and weapons plant in the eastern part of the city, as well as expansion of the rail yards. That makes Linz a military target. Uh, Before construction can begin on the museum or any of the major structures, the war intervenes, and none of that is actually built. So fortunately, most of the artwork is buried in salt mines or, or wherever and survives the war. Uh, looking at your background, you've spent your career in the CIA, and you've published several scholarly articles and academic books uh, on the uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, uh, and also other events in, uh, of, of contemporary time. Why did you choose World War II to write this book? This is a personal story for me, and I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, my uncle was the lead bombardier for his squadron on this mission. It was his 21st combat mission, and he made it through without a scratch. He he and his crew returned to the United States after the war. He was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, awaiting discharge and got a chance to hop on a plane at very short notice and fly to Wisconsin. And the family was in Illinois, so he intended to travel onward from their home. And that plane crashed, killing him and all on board. So as I grew older and my father, who was very close with my uncle, especially grew older, I I became more curious and I wanted to talk about him with my father. Uh, Word got out amongst my aunts, who all have photographic memories about my interests, and they gave me his letters from the war. I I pieced together the combat missions he went on. Uh, and I approached it as very much of a as an analyst. So I would analyze each target. Why did the Americans bomb it? Uh, is there anything historically significant about that particular town or city? And when I came to the Linz mission on April 25th, that's what really captured my attention, not just because of the Hitler connection, but because – all of the accounts that I came across online written by veterans in, for example, unit histories said the same thing, that it was an absolutely devastating mission, that the Germans turned the sky black with exploding cannon shells. Um, And many men were killed. So that really grabbed my attention. And as I dug deeper and deeper into it, it quickly became, I could write a book about this, it went from I could write a book about this to I have to write a book about this. And uh, it became my mission. I made a promise at my uncle's grave to tell a story. And now, 13 years later, I'm, I'm glad that tomorrow I can keep that promise. So, Mike, th- that generation is um, sort of famously closed-mouthed about 
speaking of their adventures during the war, did you find in doing your interviews to, to write the book, was it difficult to get them to speak to you about their experiences? Yes, I, I started interviewing right away. I would end up interviewing about 55 survivors of the mission. They all remembered it vividly. It was that horrific to them. And for many, it was hard. And I had to develop trust and spent a lot of time on the phone and in person, especially with a handful of them, really got to know them, became friends with them. And I'm glad to say that I felt meant like many were unburdening themselves, that they had kept it inside for decades. You know, when I started the interviews, the, the mission was 70 years behind them. And they did open up. And for a couple, they really dared their souls, I felt. Uh, some told me that they had never spoken of it before. And the reason many of them gave it gave is that there's just no words in the English language to describe what it was like. So I approached the, the book as a love letter to those men, and I made a particular effort to understand not just the equipment they wore, what they did at their particular position on the bomber, but what they saw, what they felt, what it was like, and how it affected them. And it's written as well for the children because many of them didn't know what their dads or uncles or grandfathers did. And I hope people who pick up the book will find some answers there. Uh, Mike, a, uh, a comment and then followed by a question. Uh, I have also had the same observation that, that John uh, Gilscrab just mentioned, that that generation was reluctant to talk about their war exploits with a caveat, and that caveat is when they were getting close to the final days, they they opened up. At least that was the case in my family. They had never talked about it for uh, several, several generations, but then at the very end they started talking. Uh, Mike, the question now. Uh, uh, several of us have been watching with great interest the uh, the Apple TV Masters of the Air uh, uh, production, which I found to be fascinating. How faithful uh, to the actual events, as you have un uncovered through your research, has Master of the Air actually been? I have loved Master of the uh, Masters of the Air. Uh, I understand that there are parts of people on the internet, sectors of people who quibble with very minute details like, you know, is this particular B-17, did it have a, a nose turret or not? I'm, I'm not a guy who can look at one of those aircraft and tell what model it is or if the rivets are in the right place. Uh, but what I would say is the, the depiction of combat, the depiction of being shot down, being captured, being imprisoned, I found to be incredibly realistic. And having, you know, written the book and heard stories practically ripped from the screen of the series, it, it deeply affected me. I can't imagine what men who went through it felt when they watched it. But I sat down, I watched most of the episodes with my children, and I, I told them, you know, that this is really, really close to what it had to have been like. And for that, I, I deeply thank everyone behind the production of that miniseries. It was deeply impactful and authentic. I've read a bit about the making of that series and the painstaking detail that they went through to try to recreate this to honor the stories of the people who went through these battles. The, the, the dogfights in the air are just so intense. It's just hard to not be wrapped up in these scenes, it kind of reminds you of the opening scene to Saving Private Ryan. You're just entrenched in this mass of humanity being just destroyed, and it's overwhelmingly intense. I can't imagine actually having gone through that, surviving it today, and then the next day you wake up and they say you're back up in the air to do that again. And that's what these guys did. You talked about you know, your uncle with the 21 missions and, and these guys that uh, that survived, if they survived one mission, to be able to go back and, and do 20 or 25 missions. And, and I also want to comment on, Bill, you mentioned about the World War II veterans who just rarely talked about. I had three uncles who served in World War II, 
one in the Pacific, two in Europe. And they never talked about it. Not even at the end. And and uh, I had one uncle who did talk. He showed us pictures about going through Hiroshima after the bomb dropped. He was a Marine. But he didn't talk about the experience of it. just showed us the pictures and walking through. And I often wondered why they didn't. And the only thing I can figure, Mike, and maybe you tell me, is if you were 19 in 1942, you probably weren't here. You probably were there. Because that's what happened in 1941, 2, 3, 4, 5. Everybody of age was over there. And you didn't have a choice in the matter for the most part, though some volunteered. But after Pearl Harbor, they all wanted to volunteer. If you talk to, they're not alive now, but my uncles, if you talk to them, everybody wanted to be over there because of the attack on America. And if you weren't volunteering, you were drafted. We don't have that today. When when our when our veterans come back from wars today, it's a small percentage of the population who have experienced it. But 80 years ago, it was a great majority of the population who experienced it. And then they came home. If they were actors like Jimmy Stewart, they went back to making movies or, or whatever. But they all had that experience in common, which I think is the reason why they didn't talk about it, Mike. Yeah, I, 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 your point is well taken. Um, the, you know... One of the men in the book that I focus on a lot is named Dale Shabilsky. He was 20 years old. Uh, he was on his 33rd mission. He had two more to go. And this man is a radio operator on a B-24. He uh, turns to the rear of the aircraft to verify that the bombs had all fallen from the bomb bay right as a shell detonates. He is wounded in two places, and the aircraft goes down. They, they make a crash landing in Hungary, and I'll try to make a long story short. He gives himself over to the Soviets, who are our allies at that time, quote-unquote allies. And they end up accusing him of being a German spy and torturing him for several days before handing him over. Um, needless to say, this was an experience that Dale you know, locked away in the recesses of his mind for many, many years. But it was the intervention of his daughter uh, late in his life that got him to not only write about it, but begin talking about it. And I did interview him once, and uh, he, he suffered for many years from nightmares and who knows what else. But I think for him, the healing came with unburdening himself and his Christian faith as well. Uh, a few other men as well sh shared with me that uh, they decided late in life, often through the intervention of a, a, a child, that it was time to start talking about it. And I'm very glad that they did. Mike, uh, you've, uh, with the success, or at least I anticipate the success of the book that you're going to release tomorrow, and also with your background, you have a very, very interesting background with intelligent foreign affairs. Is there another book in the wings that you are looking to, uh, uh, to address or to write? This book was so personal to me you know, with my, the connection to my uncle, uh, I mentioned earlier that my uncle was killed just after the war ended, and that entire uh, episode in, in my family's tragic history is in there. Uh, there will, needless to say, never be another story like this for me with that connection, nor will there be another opportunity to have the firsthand accounts of so many veterans since they are all uh, mostly departed at this point. I, I don't have a firm yes or no for you. Uh, I do have an idea for another book that would be on another topic completely. I uh, don't know that I will get to it, but I uh, certainly enjoy writing and, and would never pass up an unforgettable tale of World War II or any other war if one presented itself. Why are there so few books written about Korea? as compared to uh, First and Second World War and also Vietnam. That has been called the Forgotten War, and it truly is. I agree, and I don't understand it. I mean, it was an amazingly devastating conflict, and, you know, those men are the age that the World War II generation was when I was interviewing them. Uh, 
I would hope that people would realize that the time is running out on that generation and that uh, the story stories like what I've told in my book need to be told as well. And many who fought in World War II fought in Korea as well. They did, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, did you have a final thought, John? I did have a final thought. <clears throat> I just wanted to say, you know, I, I hope the book does really, really well for you, Mike. I, I wanted to just say that some books need to be written, and sometimes the karmic value, karmic, K-A-R-M-I-C, karmic value of, of, of writing a book is that you're the vector of setting families at ease, telling stories that otherwise wouldn't have been told. You're having an impact, and I think that's really a good thing you're doing. Thank you. And I, I wrote it, like I said, as a love letter to not only the men and their families, but I also wrote it as if I was on board one of the bombers. You know, a person reading it should feel what they felt to, to the maximum extent the written word can convey. You know, obviously we'll never know the true magnitude of it, but one reading it should um, feel like they are on one of the bombers. I, I did that on purpose for the men and their their uh, descendants, and God bless them all. Um, I hope, you know, those watching from above will find some closure in this if they didn't find it on Earth. Mike, thank you very much for your time this morning. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Have thank you, you Mike, and best of luck on the, the book. So. Mike Croissant, so the uh, author of Bombing Hitler, Hitler's Hometown, 